to fill our lives with your love, that we may not only hear, but also do your word. Amen. And today's scripture is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. And no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other one left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what, at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Thanks be the word of the Lord, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So there are these two guys standing on opposite sides of the river. And one guy says to the other one from across the river, Hey, hey, I need you to help me get to the other side of the river. And the guy on the other side of the river goes, You're already on the other side of the river. <laughs> it's a matter of perspective, right? Yeah. It's a matter of goal. It's a matter of purpose. Um, we are in the beginning of Advent. This is the new year for Christians. Uh, we're speaking about the Gospel of Matthew this year instead of the Gospel of Luke that we spoke of last year. So all things are new. Why are they putting these things about the end of time into these scriptures for us to read and study? And um, I think it has to do with the idea for this one of being ready. I want to go through the scripture and bring out some of the Greek things that I heard and compare what's in the scripture to other things that I've been studying and thinking and reading about and watching in movies and so on as it happens. And then there's a story that um, Carolyn reminded me of that I probably will end with, although I want to add a couple of other things too. So we'll start with the idea of we don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, the idea of waiting for the return of Jesus is sort of to me like waiting until you die or waiting until you get that perfect job, or waiting until you meet that perfect person, because it's an excuse for us not to live in the moment. And I think uh, that's one of the things that Jesus talked about. The kingdom of God is right here. It's right here. So we shouldn't wait to live well um, while we're waiting for Jesus to come back, while we're waiting to go to heaven while we're waiting for all these other things to happen. We need to live well now. Um, I just finished reading Many Waters by Madeline Langle. I think I talked about this a little bit last week. Um, it's a story of these two 15-year-old, six-foot-tall boys who get transported through time because their dad is a scientist who does the time-space continuum and their mom is a scientist who does Particle, particle physics, particular physics, whatever you call it. And 
So they walk into their lab looking for Coco, uh, not seeing the sign on the door that says, experiment in progress, please stay out. And they mess with the computer and they end up, because they're very cold, it's Connecticut, it's winter time, they are wanting warm, so they type in any place really, really, really warm. And they end up back before the flood in Noah's time when the earth was just being formed and there were volcanoes everywhere and there were no rivers to speak of and if there were, they were underground and they get lost and one of the boys goes to this bunch of people that don't feed him, that don't feed each other, that fight and argue and drink too much and throw him into the garbage dump and the other one lands with this family that takes care of him and they end up getting together again. But the idea is that while they're waiting for the flood to happen, the boys know about the flood because they've read scripture a little bit. They've heard this story before. And they're worried because one of the kids of Noah is a girl. And she's not mentioned in the story of the flood in scripture. And so they worry about her and they try and figure out how to take care of her and there's seraphim and nephilim and there's manticores which are human and lion and scorpion and there are mammoths that are the size of little poodle dogs and there are unicorns that come in and out i mean and and i should say madeline lingo was an episcopalian woman who every day of her life worshipped did a worship service in the morning and a worship service in the evening in her home. She sang a song and said a prayer and looked at a piece of scripture and thought about it and took communion for herself and whoever was with her. Um, so she's a very religious woman is what I'm trying to say. So I noticed when I read this that it talks about well, they were married and given in marriage and, you know, basically people just lived their lives. And if they were good people, they were good people. And if they were bad people, they were bad people. And I want you to notice that when the flood came, and the Greek for flood is cataclysm. It doesn't say flood, it says cataclysm. When this cataclysm happened, it swept everybody away except for the people who were good to one another except for the people who were nice to one another, because the family that took in the kid that took care of him, that was Noah's family. So they took care of each other. They honored one another, even if they were from different backgrounds. The daughters-in-law were all different backgrounds. They honored and respected one another and cared for and looked after one another, and they survived. And the daughter survives, too. You have to read the story. I don't want to spoil that for you. So that's the first piece. Then the second piece of the scripture is this um, taken and left thing. And it doesn't say men, and it doesn't say women. It says two are in the field, one is taken, one is left. Two are grinding corn, one is taken, one is left. Now, the words for the Greek for taken could be kidnapped. Taken could be kidnapped. Taken could be taken prisoner. Taken is what they said when they took people from Israel to Babylon. They took them, and it was the same kind of word. And the word for left is a fiamine. A fiamine, which D. Mark Davis translates as forgiven. But it's really, let it go. Let it go. The, um, when the children come to Jesus and the disciples shoo them off, and Jesus says, Ephiami, let the children come to me, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And when the woman anoints him with oil before his time of passion, it's in all four gospels, it's from different perspectives in all four gospels, but when the disciples in three of the Gospels say, hey, that ointment could have been spent for a year's wages and we could have fed a lot of hungry people, Jesus says, a fiamme. A fiamme. What she's doing is so important that when my story is told, this act will be told too. A 
the end of his life on the cross, he makes a loud cry, and the word is afiani. It is finished. I'm letting go. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So the idea is the taken people could be taken into prison. The left behind people could be forgiven. Have all their sins washed away. Be able to start over. The next part is um, where Jesus says, you know, if people knew when the thief was coming, they'd be more prepared. Well, I don't know how many of you saw, but a, a week ago, there was this 82-year-old woman. Did you see that? 82-year-old woman, somebody broke into her house to steal from her. She threw a table at the guy. She scored a dish soap in his face. She beat him with a broom. The policeman saved him from her. She's 82. They had a picture of her. She has muscles. Oh my gosh. Like, like the Sistine Chapel, you know, God's muscles and the Sistine, that lady had those muscles. But that's the idea, see. I think we need to be prepared in the ways that we can be prepared. Last week I told a story about a farmer who hired a boy to help him, and the boy's recommendation was that he could sleep through a storm. And the farmer said, well, that's kind of weird, but I'll hire him anyway. And it turned out that was a good recommendation. Jesus did it in a ship one time. He was sleeping and there was a huge storm. And the disciples said, wait a second, we're dying. What are you doing? Sleep, get up, do something. And he got up and he said, peace, be still. And there's a health, um, mental health hotline going on up here, which is kind of fun. So, um, <laughs> Did you push your button that they're going to come in to your house and take no, you to the hospital? Okay. Um, oh, it's an email. Oh, anyway, so you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. I'm very um, unfocused most of the time, so you see things distract me easily. But the idea is that while we're waiting for Christ to come into our world and cataclysmically change everything. Make it a world of peace and joy and love. Um, we need to prepare by being ready, by doing good. There's a beautiful thing that John Wesley said a long time ago. Do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. These are words for always, but especially at the beginning of the Christian year in um, Advent. And then there's this song. No more lives torn apart. I woke up singing this song this morning. That wars would never start and time would heal, oh heart. Everyone would have a friend that right would always win, and love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. It's a beautiful song. Um, Amy Grant and Carrie Underwood, no, somebody, um, sing it on YouTube. It's lovely. My daughter played it after, um, when we were decorating her Christmas tree the day after Thanksgiving. A couple weeks ago, this was in the paper. Um, it's by Woody Woodburn, Stories That Will Lift Your Spirits. Okay, so um, uh, he writes this column and he said that he wants to, um, okay, I'll just read the whole thing. My late mentor and longtime steward of this space, Chuck Thomas, believed in taking the day off now and filling his column with words borrowed from others. In the spirit I hear, uh, in the spirit here are three stories I read recently that I hope will lift your spirits as they did mine. Christine Turai, 
um, who works at an independent bookstore, shared this encounter. Middle of the day, this little old lady comes up. Then this college kid comes up in line behind her. She turns around to him and out of nowhere demands that he put his textbooks on the counter. He's confused, but she explains that she's going to buy his textbooks. He goes, sheet rock, sheet rock white. Sheet rock white. He refuses and adamantly insists she can't do that. It's like $400 worth of textbooks. She, this tiny old woman, boldly takes them out of his hands, throws them on the counter, and turns to me with an intense stare and tells me to put them on her bill. The kid at this point is practically in tears. He's confused and shocked and grateful. Then she says, you need chocolate. <laughs> she starts grabbing handfuls of chocolates and puts them in her pile. He keeps asking her, why are you doing this? She responds, do you like Harry Potter? And throws a copy of the new Cursed Child on the pile too. Finally she's done and I ring her up for a crazy amount of money. While I'm bagging up her merchandise, the kid hugs her. She turns to both of us and says probably one of the most profound unscripted things I've ever had someone say. It's important to be kind. You can't know all the times that you've hurt people in tiny, significant ways. It's easy to be cruel without meaning to be. There's nothing you can do about that, but you can choose to be kind. That's story number one. This is the second one. This came from a Facebook post by the Pay It Forward Effect. As I was pulling into work, I was following this car. The sign in the back window says, Learning stick, sorry for any delay. Knowing this information, I was very patient with their slow shifting. Then I asked myself a tough question. Would I have been just as patient if the sign hadn't been there? I can almost definitely say no. We don't know when someone is going, what someone is going through. We don't wear signs that illustrate our personal struggles we don't see signs taped to people's shirts that say going through a divorce or lost a child or feeling depressed or diagnosed with cancer. But we shouldn't have to see signs and have reasons to treat strangers with kindness. We should do it anyway, whether we know what is going on or not. Like Carolyn was talking about those crazy drivers. I think of that all the time too. Number three, a brief essay by Danusha Lamer Lameris, titled Small Kindness Echoes the Wisdom Above. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by, of how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague, don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. We have, we know, we have so little of each other now. So far from tribe and fire, only those brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat, go ahead, you first. Or I like your hat. By the way, Teresa, I like your hat. Carolyn reminded me of a story, and so I'll close with this. Um, boy was going home from school one day, high school, and there was this kid walking with just a ton of books, and the three other kids ganged up on him and started beating him up and throwing his books around and stuff. So this other kid came up and said, stop that, what are you doing? And chased the other guys away and helped the kid pick up his books and walked him home, and they found out they lived about a block from each other. They'd been there for since they were little, but they didn't know each other. And so there started a friendship. Well, the kid who had all the books, um, he kind of blossomed under this friendship, and he, he got in different clubs, and he joined different ball teams, and ended up being the valedictorian of the class. And as he was giving his valedictorian speech, he said, I want to thank my friend. Because the day we met, 
I was taking all my books home so that when I killed myself, my mom wouldn't have to go to school and empty out my locker. But because I knew somebody cared for me, then I began to live my life. Now, we're in the season where all kinds of wonderful things happen, and yes, they should happen all year, and they don't, generally. But I want to ask us to try and do one random act of kindness every day, even if it's just picking up a piece of trash on the sidewalk, even if it's just smiling at somebody that you don't know when you walk by them, even if it's like Carolyn turning around and going in front of somebody instead of behind them and just saying hello. I've had people who are uh, homeless and I'll speak to them and one guy, I said, you know, I don't have any money. He said, that's okay because you've been talking to me like I'm a real person and that hasn't happened to me in over a year. So during this time, in the midst of all this craziness, let's remember to be ready and to use God's perspective. Not one side of the river or other, but the whole thing. Oh gosh, do I, I okay. Um, so there's another joke about a river. Three guys go to the river and it's rushing and they need to cross it. And one guy says, Lord, give me the strength to make it across. And he jumps into the river and he swims and it's really a struggle and he goes a couple miles down the river and he ends up on the other side and he's okay. And the second guy says, God, give me the tools to cross this river. And so all of a sudden there are planks there and hammer and nails and, and tar and he builds a boat and he goes across the river. And the other guy says, God, give me the wisdom to cross the river. And he turns into a woman and he looks up the river and he sees there's a bridge. And so he crosses the bridge. Okay, I feel it. <laughs> we are to be living our lives as though this is the last day, the last minute we get. We are to love one another unconditionally the way God loves us. And we're to do that all the time. But especially now. And especially in this place. Thanks be to God. Amen.